It is um, 5.05 and I want to get it started. And as Jack said in the, um, the chat, uh, there's so many different people joining us from all over and we're so excited to have you all. Thank you for making the time um, to join us this evening. Uh, I um, just am going to kick it off by throwing it over to Mason Funk, um, who's going to be saying some words on behalf of Outwards. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much uh, for your introduction. And hello, everyone. It is an enormous pleasure to have you all with us here today. This is a production, this event of Outwards in partnership with Hope Lab. And you're going to be hearing more about Hope Lab in a few minutes. But on behalf of Outwards, I want to say welcome. Outwards is a nonprofit organization officially known as the Outwards Archive. We're based in Los Angeles. Um, and our mission is very simple. We travel the country, whether in person or more recently uh, virtually, recording interviews with LGBTQ elders across the United States. We were founded about five years ago. To date, we've collected something like 182, 82, 182 interviews with LGBTQ pioneers and elders in 33 states, I think. We partnered up with Hope Lab, who, as I mentioned, you're going to hear more from them, but they are very interested in the intersection between LGBTQ elders and queer youth. And so we decided to create a panel of three interviewees that we thought would have a lot to say to LGBTQ or queer youth in the United States and, in fact, beyond. Those panelists, as you're seeing on your screen right now, are Mandy Carter, a longtime legendary LGBTQ and civil rights activist, originally from upstate New York, made her way out to San Francisco during the Vietnam War era, protested the war there, eventually bounced back to Durham, North Carolina, and that's where she's speaking to us from today. Mandy was one of the co-founders of an incredible organization called Southerners on New Ground. And she was also one of five national co-chairs for the Obama campaign, national LGBTQ co-chairs of the Obama campaign in 2008. Next up is Renee Imperato from New York, born and raised, still living there. Uh, as Renee will tell you, born in Hell's Kitchen. Renee has been an extraordinary uh, advocate for transgender people, for healthcare, for Black Lives Matter, and countless other causes over the course of her life. She's also a US veteran. She is an important mentor to gender fluid, gender non-conforming, and gender questioning people and youth in particular in New York and far beyond. And lastly, we have Alex Sanchez, a Lambda award-winning YA novelist. Alex has written 10 novels. Um, his, his novels have been translated into many, many languages. One of his early ones, Rainbow, Bo Rainbow Boys, was called a best book for young adults. His novel, So Hard to Say, won a Lambda Award. Uh, he wrote a graphic novel called You Brought Me the Ocean from DC Comics. And his most recent book, The Greatest Superpower, came out just, a year, just this year, actually. So we're going to be hearing from these individuals in a few minutes. But if I could say a couple of words more about Outwards, um, and if you could just go on to the next slide there, Maria. Um, Sorry, one sec. Okay, well, I can blather on about Outwards endlessly. I just want to say that we are doing a special campaign this month, uh, there's that screen, um, called We've Got Your Back. This is in conjunction with National Give Out Day. We've Got Your Back is what we effectively feel that queer elders are saying to queer youth every single day. We've got your back and queer youth in, in turn are saying, it is so amazing to know that not only do they stand on the shoulders of their elders, but they can feel their elders behind them, urging them on, inspiring them on, sharing wisdom when it's appropriate and passing the torch so that these younger folks can become progressive change, change, change agents uh, today, tomorrow, and for years to come. You can find us, as you can see, on Instagram at the Outwards Archive, on Facebook at the Outwards Archive, youtube.com uh, uh, forward slash Outwards, um, and at the Outwards Archive.org. Um, that's, I think, everything I have. And at this point, I'm going to hand it off to Fred Dillon uh, from Hope Lab, and he's going to tell you more about that incredible organization. Thank you so much, Fred. Yeah, thank you, Mason. It's such a pleasure to be here tonight with you all. And I'm excited to tell you more about 
Hope Lab and the work, uh, a project we're working on called Project Milk. Uh, so I'll just do a quick overview of this because I want to make sure we get to our uh, panelists that we're all eager to hear from. So just a little bit about Hope Lab. Uh, we co-create products uh, to improve the health and well-being of young people. Our staff is made up of behavioral scientists, designers, and youth experts, all trying to positively change the health and well-being of young people. Uh, and a range of products that we've worked on over the years. We've been around since 2001. So really thrilled to be doing this with Outwards. Um, a, a couple of years ago, our team started to explore opportunities to really support the mental well-being of LGBTQ teens. Um, and we knew these youth are facing systems, structures, all kinds of societal factors that are undermining their mental health. And we also knew these through surveys we've done and just a bunch of folks who have uh, anyone who knows queer youth knows they're turning to digital tools to find each other, to find community, to find support. Uh, it's a really powerful opportunity. So we started a journey to better, better understand those needs and think through ways in which we could really uh, make a difference in this space. Um, so what we, some of the things we learned in that journey so far and is that LGBTQ youth have a desire for, whoops, sorry, for a world that's more accepting, more inclusive, and more just. Um, they're actively exploring, embracing themselves on a whole number of dimensions of intersect intersectional identities, and really want to feel more confident and proud and accepted for who and what they are. Um, so that's fundamental to um, their aspirations and dreams of where they want the world to go and what they expect. Um, but as I said, the stress of being LGBTQ in a cisgender and heteronormative world uh, is harming their mental well-being. And I think many of us know these stats. Um, queer youth are still twice as likely as their non-queer counterparts to feel sad or hopeless and really tragically three times as likely to have considered attempting suicide. Um, so a whole host of, uh, of factors that we know are because of the societal structures and uh, things they face in their environment. So we formed a collaborative that we call MILK. Uh, Harvey MILK, we're based in San Francisco. Harvey MILK was uh, one of the very first out gay politicians. So uh, we really celebrate him. There's a quote here, but there's other quotes he have about we got to give him hope. That was like his whole goal way back then was to give youth hope all over this country uh, about their lives. So we're really inspired by that and all that's come from that. And we, this collaborative now includes three organizations. It's ourselves at Hope Lab, but also Centerlink, uh, which is the community of LGBTQ centers around the country um, that represents a whole host of folks to help get out the message about this. And the It Gets Better project that some folks may be familiar with that also really tries to uplift um, queer youth and make them feel really confident as they go out in the world and what, can come, what will come next for them. Our goal is 100,000 happier, healthier, queer young people uh, through the products that we're going to develop. And we're co-creating a science-backed digital tool for queer teens to explore and affirm their identity. Um, this is a prototype of what we've developed so far where young people can interact with it, uh, talk about things that have influenced them, get some support, learn more about gender and about sexual orientation and a whole host of things that can be helpful to affirming them in their identity, even places where they can draw, like what's your gender journey been over time? So a bunch of things like that where um, they can learn more and get support. Um, so this is a little bit about how you can follow us. We'll provide this at the end as well, uh, that we've got a newsletter. If you know LGBTQ plus teens uh, who want to be involved in this or are one yourself, there's a way to sign up to help us give feedback on the product. Um, so we're really excited uh, to keep this moving forward. So that is that. I think, Mason, you've done, do you want to pick up the mantle from here? Or we can move right into the video. Is that what we sh what we should do next, Jack? Yep. Okay. Great. Then I'm gonna stop sharing, and uh, we'll let we're now gonna be able to hear from uh, our panelists in their own words. On a scale of one to ten, ten being 
bring it. One being, was there any point to get up this morning? I'm a constant 10 because I've seen the change that can happen. I had the good fortune to organize uh, an effort called um, North Carolina Senate Vote 90 because in 1990, Harvey Gant, the first black mayor of the largest city in North Carolina, Charlotte, was running against two Republican Jesse Helms. Jesse Helms, long before coming after gay people, um, was one of the staunchest segregationists who ever lived. The, the audacity of Harvey Gant became international news. It was just extraordinary. And while we didn't win that campaign, there's this wonderful concept about sometimes you lose forward. Did you ever think, ever in your life, that we would have a black man, the president of this country? I sure did not. Now we've got Kamala. We're on the verge, in my opinion, right now. We're going to see the first woman of color president of this country. It's going to happen. And so if you want to say it's possible, yeah, bring it. And so here we sit, literally on the verge of history and history. When I was younger, uh, let's say I was walking down the street. And on the side of the street that I was walking was a construction site. And the construction workers are lunch hours, sitting outside eating their lunch. I would cross the street to the other side. And then when I got past the construction site, I would go back to the side of the street that I was walking. You know what I do now? I do the opposite. I walk right by them to make up for all the years that I lived in shame. And you know what? Let me say this, that's freedom. And you fight for your freedom and you make your freedom every day. So they can beat us, they can wound us, they will never, ever defeat us. When I was growing up, my mom was very open to my, you know, playing with, with gender. And if I wanted to dress up as whatever, trying her makeup, whatever. I'm really uh, excited now to see, you know, parents who are letting their children experiment with gender and, and what do they feel most comfortable with? What do they identify uh, most with? How do they want to express themselves? This whole questioning of, well, what's the point of uh, labeling with genders to begin with? Relationships that I've been in with men or with women that uh, they would feel very uncomfortable around uh, the idea that, you know, I have attraction to men or women. Sometimes our fears are because then it causes us to, you know, question our own identity. I am sometimes in situations with people where it's like, okay, I'm uncomfortable, but I'm going to sit here. <laughs> I'm going to be uncomfortable and be willing to, to look at that and question, you know, why is that? And, you know, fortunately I have, you know, this gift where I'm able to write and explore that. And a lot of times younger uh, people will call me up, I mean, or text me with something like, I'm sitting on a park bench in Washington Square. You know, whether, it, whether it's worth it to live, I'll get on the phone with them, and listen to them and be resolute and strong with them. I will be firm. After we get off the phone, then I break down in tears. You want to know something? A life lived? I wouldn't have it any differently. For all those struggles I've been in, I've never been more free than right now in this moment as we speak. Never. When I was in high school, I wasn't so much bullied, but I remember in particular there was this other boy, he was identified as queer and he got picked on and harassed and, and, and beat up. I stood by, you know, uh, silent, you know, and feeling ashamed, feeling guilty that I didn't have the courage to speak up for him but I was afraid that if I did, then people would, you know, suspect I was, I was queer. Prior to that first novel being published, it sort of like took me back to there and all the shame and guilt about being gay. And all of a sudden now everyone, you know, in my mind, everyone 
<laughs> was gonna know I was I was gay. And finally, the first uh, first review came from the School Library Journal, where the re reviewer said, you know, please have the courage to put this book on uh, your shelves. It can, you know, open eyes and, and change lives. And it's just like, oh wow, you know, my book changed lives, and. Uh, I think that really marked a turning point for me. You know, my, my own uh, meaning and purpose in life. That, you know, things that I have had so much uh, pain and anguish about now could, you know, help other people. I think for me, and I think for a lot of people, this notion of the power of one, I never really got it, but do you remember that story of Emmett Till? So Emmett Till is sent down to live with his family in uh, Money, Mississippi. The story goes that Emmy Till, with a friend, goes into the store. There's a white store owner behind the counter, and she said that he whistled at her. They ended up murdering Emmy Till. They gouged out one of his eyes, shot him, and he called his mother back in Chicago, and she said, send my baby home. I want an open casket because I want people to see what hate looks like. Thousands of people came to look at Emmy Till. That casket is now at the Smithsonian Museum. And at that point, at that point, I think for the first time ever I understood the power of one, one woman, a mother to say, I want people to see what hate looks like. Each one of us has the potential to make that happen every single time, if provided the opportunity and the sense that, yeah, I can make a difference. And you're seeing it over and over and over again. And it's not because I'm anyone famous or anything, but that notion about, yeah, I get to speak up. Yeah, I get to say something. Yeah, I can make a difference. Um, so I'm very delighted to next introduce, and one moment, let me just bring this up again. Um, uh, I'm very delighted to uh, introduce our moderator this evening for our panel. Our moderator is Primo Legasso Goldberg, who is a product design intern at Hope Lab this summer. Uh, Primo is a multimedia creative and DEI advocate based in the San Francisco Bay Area, though currently in Hawaii. Um, and uh, is currently uh, just graduated high school and is gonna be heading to Harvard University in the fall. Uh, design intern uh, who worked previously at a group called Headstream Innovation, which works with teens and entrepreneurs to develop tech that fosters wellness and inclusion. And formerly with YR Media, also, also known as Youth Radio, as a writer and peer instructor. Uh, they recently graduated high school and uh, is with our team for the summer working on the MILF project. So Primo, I'm so delighted to have you and I'm gonna let you take it away from here. Thank you so much, Fred. Um, and I just wanna echo everyone's sentiments in the chat and your sentiments as well. Um, as a young person seeing the video, just knowing that there is that generation behind my generation to support us as queer folks is, um, there aren't really any words to describe what that feels like. Um, so let's get into it. Um, before we start off, I know that um, you all have sort of familiarized yourself with our panelists through Mason's introduction and through the video as well, but I want them to be able to introduce themselves here to you now with faces and voices. Um, so if we could go around and give the folks in our audience our name, um, your pronouns, where you're from, and then we'll have a little fun icebreaker question to um, bring some lightness into the air. What is something that never fails to make you laugh? I'll model a quick introduction and pass it off to our panelists. Um, as Fred said, my name is Primo. I use they, he pronouns. Um, I'm from San Francisco, California, but I'm right now with my family in Hawaii where I grew up. And something that never fails to make me laugh, um, the panelists heard this earlier, is internet cat videos. And so I'll pass it off to Mandy. We'll then go to Renee and then mm -hmm. Alex. Okay, my name is Mandy Carter. She, her, her, she, her, hers here in Durham, North Carolina. Um, by the way, of San Francisco, by the way, since 1967. But I'm going to follow up with you, what you just said. I love little baby kittens and bunnies YouTube videos. So that really makes me happy and keeps me grounded. Good? Perfect. Amazing. Uh, Renee, do you want to take it up next? Hi. 
There we go. All right. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Renee Imperado here. Uh, so um, a lot of people ask me, uh, I have to correct them when they say Stonewall veteran. Uh, I was actually in Vietnam during the Stonewall Rebellion. I am hearing very um, um, clinical words like protest now being referred to Stonewall, which is ridiculous. Um, if I could also say this quick, I never refer to uh, Stonewall as a riot. It was the cops who rioted, and we rebelled against that. Um, so my first um, Pride March was uh, 1972, um, and uh, I worked with, um, actually, um, I could say I'm a Stonewall era veteran since many of the after hours clubs, <clears throat> I worked with Stormy De La Vere. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I got Marsha and or Sylvia away from the cops in my taxi. Uh, so presently, uh, there are a number of projects that I'm working on. One is the Transgenerational Theater Project, which has been uh, sort of in suspension because of COVID. I was elected uh, chairperson of the SAGE Advisory Council. And uh, um, I also work with uh, uh, People's Power Assembly and uh, Workers' World Party. I think that's, you know, I probably went on too long as it is. Sorry. <laughs> no worries, Renee. Um, but if you could share with our audience what pronouns you use, just so everyone can refer to yeah, everyone. She, her. Yeah, I don't have a preferred pronoun. I have a damn pronoun, <laughs> except sometimes I don't say damn. I say the other word. <laughs> Thank you so much, Renee. Um, and last but certainly not least, we'll pass it off to Alex. Well, thank you. It's great to be here. My name is uh, Alex Sanchez. I'm originally an immigrant from Mexico. Came to the U.S. with my family when I was five. And um, uh, let's see what else, as, as I was introduced earlier, I'm an author. And something that never failed to make me laugh is I love Lucy, watching old Lucy episodes, whether it's her at the chocolate factory or the vitamin or whatever it is. I can watch those things over and over and over. I'll crack up every time. Amazing. Thank you so much. Um, so just as a little reminder before we get into our panel, this is very free form, very conversational. We are discussing outside the box. So if anything that anyone says resonates with you, feel free to hop in. And I think after those quick introductions, um, what I'm really hearing is like, there is so much complexity to each of your stories um, and so many layers about who you are as, an, um, as a human and as like what composes your identity, whether that be activism, whether that be serving in the military, being um, trans, being a woman, being a person of color. And so I wanna start off with a question about that intersectionality and about that complexness of identities as queer people and as like human beings in the world. So how do you feel your intersectional identities have lent themselves to the work you've done throughout your life? How have they offered you a unique perspective on issues of queer liberation. And we'll go in the same order. We'll start off with Mandy, mm -hmm. then head over to Renee and Alex, and I'll pop this question in the chat for you all as well in case you need to refer back to it. Great. Well, before I begin, I wanna say a huge thank you to Outwards and Hope Lab. Um, this is really great. I'll start by this. I was born uh, November 2nd, 1948. And because of that, I'm part of that post-World War II baby boomers. There were about 74 million of us but I wanna add this, I don't know who's on here tonight, but I was um, born in November 2nd, 1948, but my brother older than me, my sister older than me by one year 
our mother left and never came back. So I was raised in two orphanages in a foster home um, in upstate New York. And ironically, a lot of the social workers we worked with um, came from State University of New York of, of Albany, SUNY Albany. You know who else went there? Harvey Milk. <laughs> he ended up in San Francisco, so I did. I only share that because I think for those of us for the first 18 years, and that's like, you know, Kennedy being assassinated and the Cuban Missile Crisis and King and another Kennedy, but probably the pivotal time for me was when a lot of us went out after King had gotten killed down in Memphis, he was working on a thing called the Poor People's Campaign. And we took a bus out from San Francisco and I spent like a couple of weeks at the Poor People's Campaign in 1968. Now, if you're a part of the system in New York State, you age out at 18. So after I aged out, I didn't know what I was gonna do. I actually spent time speaking of what Renee said on a park bench across from NYU in Washington Square Park during the summer of 67 before going to San Francisco. But I think for me, I'm intrigued about just generationally who's on this call, but if we got the knowledge of like the Quakers and you think about um, the, you know, the, the uh, thinking about the War Resisters League, some of these organizations that were definitely connected to the civil rights movement area, Vietnam War area era, but I think it was King's speech April 4th, 1967 that he gave at Riverside. That was one of those defining moments only because generationally, it meant a lot of the civil rights activists of the 50s and 60s, and because of his speech around Vietnam and economic justice, that created this amazing, at that time, a, a intergenerational kind of connect. And I'm intrigued to find out, is that something we can replicate now, given where we are, given our ages and, and also the intentionality so to be invited to be a part of this conversation, not only about what happened in the past, but more importantly, where do we go here from now moving forward? So to be on with Renee and Alex is just a, a treasure and a pleasure, um, but I also know what you're gonna do in the next 50 years of your life and other people as well, but the intentionality. Um, so humbled and honored to be here. And again, I think bringing it from a perspective of a, a lesbian of color out and out in visible, I'll end with this, there is something to be said about the idea for those of us in a position to be out, it's great. If we can be visible, we can be the face and voice for those who will not be able to see and be seen or heard. Um, and I feel like for a lot of people, I didn't have to worry about the parents. I didn't have to worry about coming out to parents. So it's just a little bit of a, and now do we, what do we do with this incredible journey? So honored and blessed and let's make something happen. That's what I'll end with. Good. Renee, if you want to pick it up, um, from Mandy, you can speak to the question of intersectionality, but um, she also mentioned intergenerationality, and that's definitely something that's a huge part of this conversation right now. So feel free to speak to whatever resonates with you. Oh, yeah. Um, I, as I said before, I do work with a, uh, a transgenerational theater project in New York. Um, it's mostly people of color. Um, there are no cis people involved. Um, and uh, we actually create productions that every single person in the project is part of the creation. And many of these people are absolutely brilliant. Um, and also struggling to survive as illustrated by uh, after rehearsal, they go to Penn Station to find out, uh, to scout out a place to sleep. Um, so I, I do want to say that um, um, we need to, we need to break millennia of uh, conditioning when it has to do uh, with generational. People are conditioned, even the age group that I'm in. Um, um, you know that you're required to behave a certain way or speak a certain way. Listen, uh, in the language of 50 years ago, you know, I, I'm a street queen, you know. My, my generation is Paris is burning. 
that's the people I grew, you know, grew with. Um, and I'm proud to say that. Um, but I do think that, um, how about this? How about this? You know, people ask me about gender. And you know what? I can tell you individual people I know in our community, they have their own gender. <laughs> they are their own gender, whatever it is, or no gender. Um, and I think it's the same thing um, with generations. Um, a few years ago, I used to say, I'm a stranger in my own generation. Um, and uh, I, don't, um, I don't enjoy saying that. Um, but what I do think is, is that as, as you get older, well, I'll quote my father, okay? This is, uh, you know, my father, hey, people talk about high school dropout. My father never went to high school. He was a bricklayer at the age of 12. And one thing that he always said to me was this, very simple. You can't always be what's happening, but you should always know what's happening. And that is what I strive to do. Um, uh, you know, like, for instance, uh, to be frank, to be honest, um, I actually have more conversations with people who are uh, much younger than me. Uh, they're more seamless. Um, not that I'm saying you got to, you know, act like, I, you know, I, I'm somebody 20 years, 50 years younger. But, and, and how did I do that? By listening. Not just talking. And I just want to say this, and I want to say this to any, anyone who's tuned in here tonight. I guess the word tuned in doesn't apply anymore. This and this, this is what I want to say. Because I hear from people, you know, uh, oh, you know, you're an inspiration. My answer is, without you, I'm nothing. People, um, inspiration should be a two-way street. Um, and yes, yeah, I was in a lot of struggles compared to like Marsha and Sylvia. No, I can't say that. I know people sometimes put our names together. But, uh, oh, by the way, here's a copy of the uh, memorial for Marsha in July of 1992. I just happened to have it there for another reason, but I didn't put it away. But uh, let me let me just say this. Um, you younger people, I don't care if you're 17, I don't care if you're 27 or 45. I'm nothing without you. And what Marsha and Sylvia put up with, you know, people want to talk about the challenges we face now. So just imagine like Marsha and Sylvia hustling on 42nd Street in 1965 at the ages of 14 and 15. You know, for me, I'm talking about two of the greatest revolutionaries that ever lived. Every step you took was a little mini revolution. Every one, whether it was a pumps or whatever. And um, uh, so I just want, I just would add to that, um, that question, anything you don't know, find out to know. Um, and, uh, I, I just, I'm trying to do only as much as I can. And, uh, you know, if I make a little bit of a difference, 
that's, uh, you know, that adds to the tidal wave. <laughs> I just um, want to hop in here and definitely bring Alex into the conversation because I think this idea that you're speaking to about we would be nothing without each other, um, I would imagine ties very into ties very directly into your work as a YA author, Alex. So did you want to speak to that aspect of intergenerationality in your work um, and how you've lived that out throughout your life? Sure. Well, you know, it goes back to the the question of uh, you know intersectionality that you know as I said. When, when my family, when we first came to Texas, it was the early 1960s and schools had only recently been desegregated. And a lot of people don't know that in, in Texas, most of the Southwest, that wasn't just with uh, uh, segregation with African-American people, but also with uh, you know, uh, Mexican-American people and uh, also with Asian-American uh, people, uh, schools were segregated. So it was the, uh, the first time that uh, you know I experienced uh, the shame around prejudice, getting picked on uh, by by other kids, being shamed because I didn't speak English and because I, I was I was Mexican, and so you know experiencing that 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 that, that shame, uh, uh, you know I no longer wanted to speak Spanish when when my my parents would go out shopping or to a restaurant. I'd tell them, you know, speak only English. I learned English as quickly as I could. I stopped telling people I was from from Mexico. So you know, I became closeted. You know, to to use the language of of LGBT people. You know, bearing that part of myself uh, deep inside. And I thought, okay, you know, like any other kid, I wanted to belong. I wanted to be accepted. And I thought, okay, now I'm just like, you know, the, the, the white majority. And then, you know, in my teens, when I started realizing that the attraction I felt to, to other boys my age, that uh, that was something that I, I wasn't supposed to be feeling. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, I'm not the same. And then feeling all that uh, shame and, and guilt. And once again, bearing that part of myself, not, a, not being able to, uh, express and accept that that part of myself and and so I think what happens uh, you know when we go through experiences like that as young people lots of times it's those feelings get frozen up inside and it's not until later on in life when we start to uh, when we're able to accept ourselves more and in my case as, as an author that's what started coming out you know all those feelings that had been buried then I was able to write about them and, and communicate uh, them and then the, the gift, the gift that I found was, uh, you know, as as Renee was saying, you know, I'm nothing without you. That all of a sudden I would get this response, these emails from from young people, and visits uh, uh, to, to to schools, where you know, at, at first it was a little scary, where where young people would say, you know, the 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 teens that you write about, they're my role models. And I'd be like, no, 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 don't do that because you know they make mistakes in the book, and I was scared about that. But what I started realizing was, no, that gave them hope that, that they weren't alone. And that was what was so scary for me uh, as, as a young person, that feeling of, you know, I'm the only one. You know, this was back in the dark ages before the internet, you know, before, you know, people uh, would, you know, start, start speaking more openly about uh, sexuality, uh, not, uh, not to mention all, you know, issues of, of gender. And so that, that, in terms of the intergenerationality, a real gift for me has been now having that, that circle of communication uh, with young people where I'm able to write stories that help to in, uh, encourage and inspire and empower them. And in turn, you know, when I would get emails, it was people not just, uh, uh, young people not just commenting on my books, but telling me their stories. And I, at first it's sort of, I, I wonder why are, why are they you know, telling me? And then I started realizing this was the first time that they had, you know, been able to articulate to someone else, this is who I am, and to let go of, of that, that shame that, you know, as much as our, our society and culture has changed in terms of uh, uh, queer, queer issues, so fun times for, for young people, there still are those struggles with, with uh, uh, acceptance, you know, both from other people and, and accepting ourselves. So, you know, as, as, as I, you know, as I was growing after high school coming out, I was very fortunate that there, that I did meet, uh, uh, you know, quote unquote, elders in my life, 
who then I was able to look up to and, and who gave me courage in terms of how to be, uh, how to live my life, how to, you know, uh, love and accept myself and, uh, you know, be able to be empowering and, and sharing of others. So, you know, from my own experience and the generosity of, of people that I was fortunate enough to, uh, to meet. And I think it's a real gift now that we have, that we have this uh, community that I did not have when, when I was growing up and that there's so much power, uh, you know, that we do have each other help us, uh, help us be who we are. And I think that's really something beautiful and unique about the queer community as well as that so often we are rejected by the family that we're related to by blood and like many things in life I think that's a like a coin with two sides because where our blood family fails us we're able to create our own family and I think chosen family is something that every queer person in this space and across many places in the world can relate to um, and so related to that I want to go back to something that Renee said earlier about how um, this quote from her father that you can't always be what's happening, but you should always know what's happening. So I want to ask each of you, um, feel free to respond in any way that you want. And this definitely ties in with intergenerationality as well. How do you know what's happening? How do you stay connected with young people? Um, how did you get started in your connections with young people? Because I think a lot of us, myself included, didn't have access growing up to queer elders. And that's um, really something that I think is really sad about the queer community is that we are so often separated from our elders because, because of just the general stigma in society. And so how did you all make those connections? How did you find those connections with young people? And anyone you know, can start us off. Oh, I was gonna say, I'll just quick uh, ch chime in. Primo, you know, I've really been struck by something. Um, essentially, I always wonder, all you know is all you know. You know, I mean, if all you've known all your life, I mean, even being raised in an orphanage and foster homes for the first 18 years, that's the only world that I knew. And it isn't until you bump into something else or some other situation that is, oh, so that's what that's about, that might be. But if we were to do a go round and each person has said, how do we end up here with this conversation? how do we end up with Outwards? how do we end up with Hope Lab? And so I think it's really good for people to slow down a little bit and share their journey. But I would also say this, I'm intrigued about something. Um, here in North Carolina, um, I did finally find out where my mother was born. It was extraordinary. I had no idea what her name was, where she was born, but the Schenectady Children's Home, which is still there, set my paperwork. And she was born in Edenton, North Carolina. I had not a clue. And I moved here to get my driver's license. Um, but I guess what I'm wondering now is that, how do you define family? How do you define who's around you? Now, at one point, I used to be 17 years old, and I'm now 72, but I think the, what I love, though, is how intentional we can be to be in each other's spaces. Um, I know that we have this wonderful group called BYP 100, Black Youth, I think it's called Black Youth Project 100. You have El Centro, Mahente. For me, when I'm sitting here, especially with COVID, I've been able to go to other tables, if that's the best way to describe it, and show up in a space. Um, but then there's like commonalities that we have. And if I were to go 10,000 feet real quick, what would I have in common with someone who lives in a rural county, someone who doesn't speak English, someone who's like, uh, you know, um, differently abled. So I would just say real quick, clean air, clean water. Everyone should be not homeless, food security. And when you think about those things, I'm 72 now, I'm really concerned about food security where I have a place to live. Am I gonna be able to get medical attention? So unless there's a way that we can find common ground around those issues and where would I show up in the space to be able to have that conversation with you, I think that's what I like a lot right now. And I'll end with this. I do not know how to do Snapchat. I don't know how to do TikTok. I, I, I even said, can you give me a Facebook page? Because that's all I know. So maybe y'all can help me learn how to about this social, social media. Um, but that would be a practical thing because I'm afraid that if I don't know what you know and how we communicate, we're like crossing each other. So that would be a real practical thing as a, an elder organizer, but also exchanging it with the youth. So show me how and teach me that, I'd be open for it. I definitely think Hope Lab and Outwards are the right spaces to be doing those things in. Um, Alex and Renee, did, you, did either of you wanna add on to that or respond to anything that Mandy was just talking about? 
Well, what I've found, I guess, as, as an author, I've just been incredibly fortunate that, that you know, these oppor opportunities at, uh, you know, uh, connecting across generations uh, sort of, you know, have presented themselves to me, whether it's, you know, invitations to uh, speak at schools or to do, uh, you know, internet things, things like this. And so what, what I have found is, you know, just uh, always have an open mind, an open heart and, and uh, you know, and then, you know, sometimes, you know, there'll be paid speaking gigs and that's wonderful. And other times they'll be from, from groups and schools that they don't have the bucks. And it's like, okay, well, you know, let's, uh, let's work something out anyway, because I know the importance, you know, again, it goes back to, you know, how crushingly lonely it was for me uh, growing up. So that, you know, when people reach out to me, being, being uh, willing to, to respond. Anything else um, to drop in there, Renee, about chosen family, about community, about connecting with other generations? Oh, I think you're on mute right now. There you go. Am I good? You are all good. good. Yeah, all good. Okay. Um, well, I think mm -hmm. that that first of all, what you have to do uh, or I should say what I do, um, because maybe the way I do it is not the way other people do it. So like, uh, to start in a nutshell, when I turn on the radio, I don't want to just listen to golden oldies. I love golden oldies. I do. Not 24-7, 365. You need to um, really lock in as much as you can, um, not just to the political consciousness, but the popular culture, um, language. Um, hey, uh, I'm sure that the other people on the panel can remember when we were younger, bed was good. Right? <laughs> so language has constantly evolved. It certainly has, my goodness, if we want to talk about the evolution of language in the, in, in, in the trans community, my God, I mean, you know, uh, I hear sometimes younger people and sometimes older people, um, when they hear the word drag queen, they disparage that name. Well, I try to tell them, especially the white ones, if I can be clear, the first known bull, known bull, because we don't know if they were, was in Harlem in 1869. Um, and that movement blossomed just in, oh, three, four short years. Uh, the number of people uh, participating was even more. And so with that, let me just say this, and I tell, you know, people who are insensitive, I will tell them this, you know where the word drag queen comes from? The oppressed community. We've been told we're downtrodden. We're told we're not as good enough. This whole idea that we're for the monarchy is ridiculous. What people were doing was using the word to say, we're, for, that's, we're royalty. We're not your white monarchs, but we, we are the important people in the world. And, uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, I've had, you know what? I've, I've written about Stonewall because I worked. Uh, you know, listen, when you're 22 years old, it's 1973. Uh, you know, it's all, well, 72 actually. Yeah, that's only three years since Stonewall. So you could be working, you know, in a bar or someplace with someone who, was in the Stonewall Rebellion at age 18. You know what I mean? We're not all 100. 
<laughs> um, but uh, um, the important thing is to communicate and if necessary and diplomatically correct people. Because, you know, I had somebody recently say to me, it wasn't just drag queens at Stonewall, it was trans women too. Hey, language of the day, number one, we, we didn't have a lot of these terms. And you know something else? We were all drag queens. That was the term that was used. Whether we use it now or don't is another question. I'm talking about historical accuracy. And you know what? We took, drag queens took their share of fatalities, believe me, and murder. And so, you know, I've had, like somebody once said to me, uh, oh, you know, yeah, somebody got killed. And they said, oh, the way you talk about drag queens, do you consider that a good thing? You know, people need to get their priorities together and all this divisiveness, which, if I can say, um, where did the word lynching come from? Willie Lynch, who taught the slave owners to divide the slaves by the complexion of their skin, treat the light ones a little bit better than the ones who are a little darker. This country was founded and stays in control by divide and conquer. And the two main things that, that got them they stole one people from their land and from the other people, um, they stole the land from them. I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Renee. So I definitely much. think that language in particular has so much potential to unite us or divide us. And I think that's something that can come from communication across generations and I think that that's really beautiful as well because young people are inventing new language um, and I think that goes back to what you said that like um, someone's gender like they are their gender and my generation at least in my eyes is now inventing terminology to describe that feeling to describe the beauty of being authentically who you are as a queer person um, and so it is amazing to me and humbling to me to be in this space with you um, to know that we are able to communicate about language um, and making sure that at the end of the day, um, everyone is accepted and included um, within the queer community. And so I wanna pivot the conversation just a little bit and wrap us up on a note about resilience and about joy. Um, we've all heard so much about your stories today through this panel discussion, through the video, through introductions. and I think one common thread that we all see is that in various capacities, um, whether it be through activism, through policy work, through writing, um, we are all, uh, myself included, as like queer activists and people who are um, rebelling against the system that is oppressing us, we're fighting for liberation, we're fighting for freedom, we're fighting for equality, we're fighting for inclusion. And all of these things that we're fighting for are inherently joyous states of being. But when struggling against oppression, it can be easy to lose that joy. So with that in mind, um, if you could all speak to how you prioritize joy in your work and support your own mental health in the work that you do, how do you help to cultivate joy for yourself and for others in your community? And we'll close out with this question. And anyone feel free to jump in. Well, I was gonna just, follow the order real quick. It's a great question. And, and again, once again, thank you for this conversation. It's interesting. Um, I was saying earlier, if we had a little poll of anyone in those post-World War II baby boomers, what's giving me hope, but also joy is some realities. It's called demographics. We have a hundred counties in the state of North Carolina. They're now majority women. Women are now numerically the um, majority of this country, keeping in mind women didn't have the right to vote, trying to pass the Eco -right Eco Rights Amendment. But um, the 18 to 35 year olds, I don't, I don't know how people want to self-identify, but they're going to outnumber our baby boomers. But I love the idea of counting those two generations together. And if I had to talk about what would be some of the things that would put us in the same room, 
And what brings me joy is to hope that, yeah, we can. I'll end with this. I, I, I've been trying to, trying to put in some language, like what is it that keeps us here? And here's something, we are still here. I wanna thank those who came before, those who are here now, those who might be joining us in the future. But I was thinking about like the audacity of Shirley Chisholm. There a black woman thinks she's gonna run for the presidency, you know? And I'm thinking of people like um, uh, uh, Septima Clark, you know, and other women who just decided that this is what we might wanna make the difference on, but also people of color, LGBTQ. But I wanna add one other one, the A for allies. I know that we have to have, think about each one of those letters, everyone had to be added, L, G, B, T, Q, same gender loving depending where you are, but the importance of how allies also play a pivotal role in that. So I would say in wrapping up, I would say, I think it's a combination um, of kind of the changing of hearts and minds and the importance of the changing of public policy. And depending on where we find ourselves generationally or our journey has been, those two seem to be sometimes going together and sometimes not. And one of the best examples has to be uh, marriage equality, thinking about interracial marriage, loving versus the state of Virginia in 1967. And then you had this incredible win um, with Edie Windsor. But the Supreme Court, when they got marriage equality for Edie Windsor, all but gutted the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So if I look at different parts of me and thinking about lesbian, black, southerner, whatever, how do I kind of figure out how all those connect and come together? but as a movement as well and intergenerationally intentionally. Um, so on a scale of one to 10, count me a constant 10. And I wanna figure out where we go with this conversation on moving forward. So that's my two cents worth. But once again, thank you so much for this generation, generational conversation we're having right now. Good. Thank you so much, Randy. Um, and so we'll go to Renee and then to Alex. How do you prioritize joy in the work that you do and find joy in your communities? Oh, if you could just unmute yourself, Renee. No worries, all this technology. <laughs> um, there's a lot of ways you do that, I think. Um, I think for me, communication, um, you know, this country, most people fear dialogue. They just do. Not, you know, there are many places that's not true. Um, and I think dialogue is uh, key to uh, not shutting down all we, uh, 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 other people. For people of us who have been around longer, we need to listen, not just listen to ourselves. Um, and as far as joy is concerned, uh, I could give you an example of it, but it would probably take 45 seconds to tell it. Do I have consent? Yeah. Why don't we close out strong? I, um, tell us about what, joy. What, what I think, what I think we do is that by being what we are, we can create joy within ourselves and in each uh, and in others. So I'll tell you this story that happened about three years ago. Um, I was in Midtown and I was on my way to Sage, which is in case people tuning in don't know, Sage is basically your senior LGBTQ centers 55 and over. Um, just a minute, I'm sorry. Hello? Hi. So anyway, I'm walking to Sage and I was like, I don't know, 6th Avenue and 24th Street, something like that. It's not a big dramatic store, but it's beautiful and simple. I'm waiting for the light to change and I was, there was some sort of affair going out. So, you know, mama was decked out, you understand? And all of a sudden I felt this tap on my forearm. And I looked down and there was this child, uh, nine, 10. I, certainly they weren't teenagers. And I looked down at them and they looked up at me and they said, 
are you gender non-conforming? And, uh, <laughs> you know, you, first I was like a little frozen. And then I looked down at them and I said, well, you know what? There would have been a time in my life where that would apply to what I was. I said, but I'm a trans girl now. And this child looked up at me and said, you're beautiful. And I was done. <laughs> and I think that's our goal. To spread our beautiful. Thank you so much, Renee. <laughs> I'm like kind of choked up over that story. And I think what you mentioned about dialogue at the beginning transitioned just perfectly into Alex because one of the many jobs of literature and art is to inspire dialogue amongst folks. So Alex, if you want to close this out for this um, panel portion, um, how do you cultivate joy in your work? So, uh, so yeah, so in terms of joy, I think what I'd like to say is, you know, you know, you're right that, you know, I shared a lot of, you know, my struggle growing up, and I think it's important to share, you know, because so many people still do, do struggle. But one of the things that, you know, while I had that shame, there was always this sort of like this admiration where I would see uh, other people who were out and who were more open and who were more, you know, claiming who they are and claiming their space in the world. And it was those people who, who, who inspired me. It's, it's like I could sense, I could feel the joy of them being who they were. And that's what pulled me along. And so it brings us back to this idea of, of community and you know, uh, you know, uh, being able to be who I am because of, because of other people. And uh, so and now uh, for, for me, you know, there, there was this, this time, you know, I'm remembering back the conversation long ago where a friend of mine uh, and I were talking and, you know, I was like, you know, if I had a, was able to take a pill uh, to be straight, I would do that. And I'd say, wouldn't you? And he's like, no, I, you know, I, I like who I am. And I'm like, really? And, you know, years later, here I am. And it's like, I love being queer. I love being gay. I love being out and open. I love being able to be who I am and express that openly. And that gives me this, this, this profound heartfelt uh, joy. And uh, when I am around, you know, friends, and I loved what Mandy said about allies, you know, regardless whether they're queer or not, people who, you know, uh, are loving and accepting of themselves. And so that joy from other uh, people, uh, you know, from, uh, from my, my husband, I never thought, you know, that one day I would have a husband and you know he gives me joy and uh being able to to you know uh be uh, have be a writer and, and be able to express myself creative expression that gives me so much joy and to be able to write about being queer and being an immigrant and all these other complexities of identity and you know that that conflict between wanting to belong and at the same time wanting to be who 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 I am and then uh, lastly, just nature. And I think, you know, nature is so attached to, to queerness because in nature is like things are who they are, what they are, and there's no pretense uh, about it. So, so uh, yes, you know, the saying goes, it gets better. It's not a straight line. Sometimes get, things get better and then they get worse, but then they get better again. But over time, it's like if we stick with it, and that's what I always tell, tell young people, no matter how much you're struggling, Stick with it. We need you. And in the long run, yeah, it will get better. It'll get better inside. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you for your strength and your love and your light. We do have about 10 more minutes of our panel here. Um, and during this time, audience, if you have any questions or wonderings or ponderings, please feel free to share them via the chat. You can um, direct chat Maria or Jack. They will be monitoring. And there's also a Q&A function um, on the bottom of your screens on the right-hand side. And so I'm actually going to pass it off to Maria to facilitate the audience Q&A portion of our panel. Thank you all so much. This was an unforgettable experience talking with you. Um, and I'll leave it to you, Maria, to take it away.
Yes, it, it's truly been such an honor. I mean, this is so such a beautiful panel in so many different ways. Um, I also want to invite folks, if you feel comfortable, uh, feel free to raise your hand as well or, um, you know, unmute yourself and we'd be happy to have you ask questions directly. Um, but I know sometimes it takes a minute to think of a question and or work up the courage to ask one directly. I am so in that camp. So I'm going to give folks a couple seconds to gather their thoughts um, and then uh, see if any come through. And if not, uh, we definitely can continue the conversation. So. Okay, well, I got one. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask this to uh, all the panelists, anyone feel free to jump in. But uh, how did you affirm your LGBTQ plus identity when you were a young person? Um, how do you boost your own confidence in the face of oppressive systems, policing and other forces? Well, I've got a very quick, quick story in terms of, you know, when, when I was the shutdown closeted uh, teen, you know, I, I would go I would go to the drugstore and get the Sunday New York Times. And I knew there was this mythical place called New York where, where I sensed there were these people who were different. And I heard about this place, Greenwich Village, and I would love to read the New York Times. And then I read about this musical called Hair. And I went and got the album. And there was this one song, the sodomy song. Uh, and it's like, that's about someone who like, like, like feels, you know, this attraction to the same sex. And I would listen to that song over and over and I would go to the dictionary and look up the words that, that were in there. And it's like, oh my gosh, you know, there, there, there are people who, you know, actually do these things and they feel these things. And, and you know, in my, in my hormone crazed, you know, teenage boy mind, it's like, that was something that gave me so much hope that these romantic feelings that I was having toward uh, other, other uh, young people that, you know, there were at least some other people out there who, who had them. And so again, you know, it just validates how oftentimes art, art can help, help us make, make those connections. So that was one <laughs> big source of hope that I remember. And uh, yeah, that's a very... And well, I was just, oh, Mandy, I, was just, I was just going to add, this is interesting because um, I'm thinking about back in the day when we didn't have this, you know, you literally had to write a letter. But what I'm really struck by, and I'll be curious if and, and anyone who's on here, you know, it used to be that if you had an LGBT center or something, people would never maybe venture in there. But because you had an email or you had access to this, oftentimes you might not step in. And I think one of the lessons learned from some of the campus groups is don't 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 rely on how many people come into that space as the way to to um, quantify, because someone they just know it's there, they just know it's there. That's a game changer. But the one that I love, Maria, is this: how many of us go about our daily lives and people see who we are, and that is the thing that keeps them hanging on until they're ready to come out or whatever. But they said, yeah, here's you know, like here's Alex with a smile, here's Renee, here's the other people. You might never know it, but the fact that you're just there and they have that ability to be able here in the South, we have a lot of rural, but because the libraries have access to a computer and there's access to like the internet, that oftentimes is literally the difference between life and death or survival. So this wonderfulness of, of, of technology and also the power of one again, like you never know who's looking at you and then you end up being the inspiration. I think that's just so wonderful and powerful. So that's the one thing I would share. That's beautiful. That's a big part of what we do at Help Labs. As we know, technology can can make can build a bridge. Um, I think uh, another question that was asked, and it's innately related to this this first question, is you know, what is one piece of advice you'd give to a young person who is exploring their queerness? Um, if you could think of something that maybe stuck with you when you were younger, um, I've gotten a lot of really awesome advice from the Milk Project here at Hope Lab. Um, so any advice you'd give to a young queer person? Can I just say real quick, I think for those of us, once again, who are in the position to be out and visible, it's just critical that we are. So we get to be the face and voice that that could be it. Um, but also, I just wonder, we have a lot of historically black colleges and universities down here in the South. And oftentimes it's a straight ally that might have more of an impact on a campus group 
some, we, you need to have a faculty advisor. We couldn't find any. They finally had a straight ally that says, I'm willing to be the person who will be willing to be an ally in that sense. So that's kind of a more of a practical level of it um, about you know, how that could make a difference with visibility on a college campus and maybe even high school. But um, yeah, for those who can be out, make sure people know about it. And for those who can't, make sure there's access to make sure that there's a way to be in connect connection or communication. Alex or Renee, what do y'all think? Oh, Renee, you're on mute. That for many of us, who have managed to get this far. I've had that. I've had other people, you know, in my age group say the same thing. How did you manage to get this far? And uh, sacrifice. Um, what the previous speaker just, I mean, actually, they said stuff that I was going to say, so it was no reason for me to, to repeat it. But uh, listen, you're not in the in the in the final analysis without sacrifice, or as you, you could even take Frederick Douglass, without struggle, there is no progress. Um, and so that struggle comes in many different forms. Now, for people in my milieu. Uh, what were some of the sacrifices? Uh, let me see. Hair, teeth, skin, and bone. Um, and uh, those who sacrifice that end or their lives, they need to be recognized in the annals of history. Um, and... Um, you know what? You know what I would tell people? This is what I would tell people. Um, there is an ancient quote from China. Um, oh, more than 1,500 uh, years old. And I read this uh, when I was younger. And then as I got older, I kind of adapted it more or less for our community. Um, because you couldn't literally take it and apply it to every, uh, every horizon in the human endeavor. And that is this. And this is what I tell uh, people that I, I wish I could have said it to myself 40 years ago when I was oppressed more than I am now. And this is what I say. When you worry what other people think of you, you will always be their prisoner. Powerful. Powerful. Yeah. Wow. 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 I'm going to toss it over to Alex to wrap us up. Um, we have about a minute left. Uh, what is a piece of advice that you would give young queer people? Sure. So what uh, I always tell young people is, you know, the most important thing is that you love and accept yourself. And, and uh, sometimes there'll be this pressure of, you know, oh, my gosh, I got to come out. I got to, you know, share with other people who I am. And it's like we got to remember, well, as young, young people, that's not always a safe thing to do all at once. And so take your time. The most important thing is to love and accept yourself. And then as you feel safe, as you feel comfortable, you know, start reaching out to those people that you you know, the people who have, you know, the teachers who have a rainbow flag on their, their door or, or, you know, the, the uh, aunt or cousin or uh, 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 grandfather, whoever it is that you, you feel, you know, that you can start to venture out. Uh, but that the, there's no, there's no, there's no rush. The future's out there. We're, we're waiting for you. You know, when I was growing up, will there ever be someone, will there be people who love and accept me for, for who I am? Yes, you know, we're, we're out there, but do it at your own pace, you know, as, as you feel good about it, we'll, we'll, we'll be here. Most important thing is love and accept your humor. All right, that was beautiful. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna throw it back to Nathan um, to, and Fred to share any closing words uh, before we all depart.
Mason, you want to go first? You go for it. I, I'm just going to say thank you. Uh, what an extraordinary privilege to be with Mandy, Renee, and, and Alex. And um, I know that our audience has drawn so much inspiration from you all. Um, I want to thank you, Primo, for, for guiding the conversation so skillfully. And uh, once again, I just want to say thank you to Hope Lab uh, for partnering with us on this event. Thank you also to Maria and Jack from our team and to Darcy uh, for helping to support us and make this all come together so beautifully. Thank you. And Fred, over to you. Thanks so much. And I just want to again also thank Outwards for partnering with us on this and to our amazing panelists and moderator for just a really rich, incredible conversation. Um, and uh, we'll have more to share. We'll, we'll take these links that we have in here and try to get them out to folks following this. And uh, please follow our work uh, and hope, hope we all connect again in real life at some point uh, in the not too distant future. So thank you all. Happy Pride. Happy, Happy, Pride. Happy Pride. Keep mm -hmm. celebrating. Happy Pride. LGBTQIA Pride. Thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Alex, Pride before everyone. you go, I would be um I would be very disappointed if I didn't get to say this to you in person. But um when I was a lot younger than I am now, I read your the short story you wrote in a compilation of queer historical fiction all out. Um, uh, and that was like the first time that I read your work and I just wanted to like just <laughs> I can't express to you like the impact that had on me as like a young or younger queer person um so when you were talking about those young people I was one of those young people um and I went on to read a lot of the rest of your work because I love queer YA um but that very first short story Secret Life of a Teenage Boy in All Out um it was yeah I have no words to describe <laughs> like how I, how I felt reading that and then to be able to be here in this space with you is really nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Primo. Really appreciate that. It means so much to me. Thank you. Mm. So long, everyone. Have a good night. Good night, y'all. Happy. Thank you so much, everyone.